This is the first in a series of short lectures on technical public speaking. Part one is on content and organization. A technical talk typically has three main parts. The introduction takes about 10% of the time, the main body takes about 85%, and the conclusion is a quick wrap up at about 5% of the time. Let's talk about what goes in the introduction. There are three required elements and two optional ones. You begin with some motivation. Why does this topic matter? Why should the audience care about this? Your introduction also contains your thesis statement. That's a statement of your main point. What did you accomplish in your work? An optional element is speaker credibility. That's where you explain why you are the right person to be talking about this. Now, sometimes you can skip this part. Perhaps there was a formal introduction of you as the speaker, so you don't need to introduce yourself or establish your credibility. Or perhaps the situation just doesn't call for it. For example, if I am presenting research at a technical conference, the program says that I'm a faculty member at UC San Diego, and that's sufficient. The introduction might have some mention of prior work. What is the prior work, and why was it insufficient? That's related to the motivation for the current work being presented. Sometimes this prior work might go in the main body of the talk, if you need to give a bunch of technical detail first. Lastly, you end the introduction with a quick roadmap, which says, what is your plan for the remainder of the talk? There are two very common mistakes that people make. They put the roadmap first before the motivation, and they make the roadmap completely generic. When someone is making this mistake, what you see right after the title slide is a slide which looks something like this. And the speaker will say, I'm gonna start with an introduction to the topic and give you some motivation for why this is important. Then I'll present the methods that we used and go through the results, and I'll finish up with a conclusion. This is completely useless. You don't need to say you're going to start with the introduction. Of course, the introduction comes at the start. And you don't need to say that you're gonna end with a conclusion. Of course, that comes at the end. Some people even say that they're going to conclude with a conclusion, not useful. And you don't wanna say, I'm going to begin by giving you the motivation for why we're interested in X. That is so demotivating. Don't announce to people that you are going to motivate them, just go ahead and motivate them. And you don't need to say that you're gonna give methods and results either. That's completely standard, so don't bother. So let me give you an example of what might be placed in an introduction. This slide is not intending to show you the actual slide design. This is just listing which elements I'm going to include in this example introduction. In a moment, I'll show you what the actual slides might look like. This is for a hypothetical 15 minute conference talk on underwater video transmission. I'd begin with some motivation, discussing how it's important for several applications. Then I'd have my thesis statement, which is that my system outperforms other systems by 5 dB. I would skip the speaker credibility part because it's not needed in this conference setting. I'd briefly discuss a few papers of prior work and give the main shortcoming of those works, which is that they didn't optimize for the frequency dependent attenuation. And then I'd give a quick roadmap for the rest of the talk. So let me show you how these elements might come out. Here's a talk intro. Underwater video transmission has many applications. On the business side, there are applications such as fish farming and inspection of oil rigs. A large fish farm might be several miles out to sea and maybe it can submerge if a typhoon is passing by. It can go down and be safely underneath the storm and then come back up again. The operators would love to have underwater video cameras for farms like that to monitor the health of the fish and to see if the enclosure gets damaged. There are military applications, for example, inspection of mines. And there are many scientific applications, such as monitoring the health of coral reefs. For all of these cases, one wants to have devices that are not connected by cable to a ship. For example, cameras that can roam autonomously and transmit the video through the water. And plus, one would like the video to be high quality. The prior work considered separately the video compression algorithms and the physical layer transmission channel rather than jointly optimizing. 
Okay, and this is where I would discuss past work, papers one, two, three. By mapping video frames with higher importance to subcarriers with higher reliability, that is by doing a joint optimization of the video compression and the physical layer, we were able to achieve a 5 dB gain in received video quality. I'm going to begin with a discussion of the underwater acoustic channel, in particular, the frequency dependent attenuation. Then I'll talk about the video compression algorithm with its hierarchical importance of video frames. After showing how we connect the frames and the physical channel, channel for transmission, I'll give some video quality results. So now, back to the public speaking topic. That was the introduction. I started with the motivation at the very beginning. Then I said something about prior work and I gave a thesis statement. Lastly, I gave the roadmap. Notice that the roadmap was very quick to present. It has visual elements and it is not completely generic. Because the roadmap comes after the motivation and at the end of the introduction, it does not mention either the motivation or the introduction. And it also doesn't mention the conclusion because that is obvious. Here's a variation on the previous example where now it's a 45 minute talk rather than 15 minutes and it's to a community group rather than at a research conference. So I'd spend more time on the motivation. Maybe I'd talk about how video transmission could help save a coral reef by detecting an underwater pipeline leak. I'd show some sample videos at the start. I'd simplify the thesis statement. If there is someone to introduce me, then I could skip the speaker credibility section. But if not, then I'd spend some time to explain who I am and what kind of research I do. Unlike the previous version, here I would skip the summary of prior work. This kind of community talk does not need to involve a comparison with, pre with prior work. And I would still have the roadmap maybe with a few more sentences. Let's move on to the main body of the talk, which can take about 85% of the time. Here, you need to figure out what is your basic organizing principle. If this is a research talk based on a hypothesis, then your main body would have a statement of the hypothesis. Then you'd cover your materials and methods and your results and discussion of results. If this is a research talk based on system development, then you might start with the assumptions and models you used. Then you'd say what you did, that is how the system works, and present results and discussion. Talks like this are structured very much like a research paper. If you're just covering system development, you might start with a system overview and then go into the various subsystems, ending up with how well things work. Another organizing principle is chronological in which you can say, first we did this, and it didn't work because of that, and so next we did this, and so forth. There are many possible organizing principles. It depends how much time you have and what the goal of the talk is. Let's look at some examples. The first example is for a science talk based on a hypothesis. So first, we state the hypothesis, which is that adults will be better than kids at producing random coin flips in their heads that is trying to emulate a sequence of random coin flips. Next, we say the materials and methods. We asked 30 adults and 30 kids to try to write down a long sequence of ones and zeros. We did some statistical analyses on the data and we present the results. Actually, the kids were closer to the distribution of actual coin flips. Surprise, we have some plots of the data and a discussion of why we think we got the results coming out the way they did. It's because maybe adults overthink the situation, thinking that because they just put three ones in a row, it's time to put a zero. So they make short runs of ones and zeros. Whereas a kid might just go zero, 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 and have a long run of zeros. And that's actually closer to what a real coin would do to sometimes have these long runs. Okay, so that's the structure. Hypothesis, materials and methods, results, and a discussion. Here's a second example showing research that is system development. We begin with the assumption that user locations and requirements follow certain distributions. 
We assume that transmission channels can be modeled as Rayleigh fo slow fading channels, for example. Then what did we do? We made a new video encoding algorithm that worked like this, and we did a simulation. We show plots of the results and discuss why it works. And lastly, here's an example where we are just explaining how a particular system works. So we might start with a system overview, giving the big picture. Then we systematically go through the various subsystems, such as the three cameras, the lighting, the control system, and the mechanical stage, and so forth. We give the results and discussion. The conclusion of the talk is usually very short and has a few prescribed elements. You need to do a recap. That is, you summarize the main result. You usually state the future work. Where does the project go from here? In most research talks, that's where you end. Just stop there and call for questions. But sometimes, especially if it's to a community group or some group where you're trying to be inspirational and not just informational, then you probably want to circle back to the motivation. You remind them why this is important. In all of this, I'm trying to say how to do informational talks. I'm not focusing on persuasive talks. If this were a persuasive talk, then there would be a lot more motivation in the introduction and the conclusion would definitely circle back to the motivation. Not only that, but the conclusion would also present a call to action. That is a statement of whatever you are trying to persuade the audience to do as a result of your talk. But for a technical talk that is an informational research talk, you don't have a call to action. And it's optional whether or not you circle back to the motivation. Always make the last slide of the talk a substantive slide. It summarizes your main point, your main accomplishment. You might also list your funding sponsors, your next steps, or your collaborators. You might have a picture of your product or of your team. It's a good idea to have some kind of visual element on the last slide. You can have the word questions as the last word at the bottom. But do not ever make your last slide just the one word thanks or questions. The audience really needs to be able to see something useful on the screen while the Q&A is going on. I know you have many times seen a slide that looks like this, but you should never do this. Here's an example of a conclusion which, which fits entirely on one slide, which is my last slide, at least my last slide of the hypothetical talk. If I were presenting this as the conclusion of a talk, I would say, so I've shown how joint optimization of the video compression algorithm and the physical layer transmission improved the quality of underwater video. By transmitting more important video frames on more reliable subcarriers, the quality increased by 5 dB. Our future work includes accounting for surface roughness and looking at systems with multiple antennas as well as relay systems. Thank you very much for your attention and I'd be happy to take any questions. So that was the conclusion. And you see that I have that word questions on the slide and I did say it out loud, but it's far from being the only thing on the slide. While I'm calling for questions, then you've got my main results figure up there in case you wanted to ask a question about the difference between the pink curve and the green curve. You've got my future work up there in case you wanted to ask about what I'm planning to do with relays. So there's a lot of useful stuff there for the audience, not just the one word questions. The last topic I want to mention in this lecture is that technical speakers often misjudge their audience when they prepare their slides. You have to remember that you are almost always the biggest expert in the room in your particular subject. Think about the various potential audiences that you might have, ranging from colleagues and collaborators who know your work in detail, to other experts, to people who are technical but non-experts, to community members and friends and family. 
if we consider various possible mistakes that you might make. On the one hand, you might talk below the level of the audience, in which case they are bored. Or you might talk above the level of the audience, and they are lost. Think about which is more common. I believe that this second kind of mistake is vastly more common. Scientists and engineers often talk above the level of the audience, and the audience is left behind. So aim for a step below what you think your audience is, and you will probably hit it right. This problem is sometimes called the curse of knowledge. It doesn't occur to the speaker that the audience doesn't know what she or he knows. In one study, two young children see a toy, and then one sees the toy get hidden while the second child is out of the room. The child who stayed in the room expects the other one to look for it in its new location rather than where it was before. So they're unable to account for the difference in knowledge. Adults think this way too. In a famous 1990 psychology experiment, people were asked to think of a common song like happy birthday and tap out the beat to it while a listener tried to guess the song. The tappers were asked to estimate the chance that the listeners would guess the song. The tappers estimated 50%, but the actual percentage guessed right was 2%. Just because the song is quite clear in your head does not mean it's clear in the other person's head. Here you are as a technical speaker trying to lead people on a path to a destination. And sometimes the mental model of the audience is like this. Here's a quick recap of the main points from part one. In the introduction, start with the motivation to make people care about your subject. Avoid using that generic outline slide which so many people use. For the main body, there are many organizing principles, so you have to see which one fits your topic best. For the conclusion, give a recap of your main point, and it's common to mention future work. But leave the audience with a substantive last slide to look at when you call for questions. And don't overestimate the audience. What's clear in your head may not be for them. That's the end of part one. I hope you check out the other videos in this series. I'm Pamela Cosman, and thank you for listening.